today will be more of a hands-on introduction to ancient microbiome analysis. Uh, and Maxime will be the one teaching you this. Uh, Maxime is a doctoral researcher in bioinformatics in the microbiome science research group in the genetics department. And his re research focuses on the development of bioinformative tools and the analysis of ancient DNA metagenomics data. Um, so yeah, Maxime, you can take it away. All right, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, I'm going to tell you a bit today about uh, ancient microbiome analysis, and we'll do this uh, with the first a few slides to introduce the theory behind it, and then we'll have a practical that will last a bit longer for the rest of the session. So um, first of all, you can find all the teaching material at this uh, address. It's tinyurl.com slash ancient microbiome. And you can find all the slides and also all the um, content of the tutorial later at this address, but we'll come back to it. Uh, who am I? So I'm Maxim Bory. Uh, I'm a doctoral researcher, formerly at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena, and now at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. I'm working mostly on ancient DNA microbiome informatics. Uh, coming from different sources. I first uh, worked uh, on samples that were coming from coprolite, so ancient feces. Now I'm working also on ancient wine samples, but always uh, using DNA and applying bioinformatics method or developing them. You can find me on Twitter, on GitHub, and there is also on my website, all the links are on this slide. So how do we analyze actually microbiomes in general? So usually the way it starts with, you start with samples, uh, whether it's gut samples, uh, meaning feces, or whether it's oral sample, meaning swabs from the oral cavity. And from this, in the samples, there are the microbes, and we're interested in the DNA of these microbes. So usually researchers, when they're working with modern samples, they take the the samples uh, and they extract the DNA from the microbes. The DNA is then uh, sent to the sequence, the sequencing. Uh, you had a nice lecture on how sequencing is working with James the other day. After the sequencer, we get this so-called FASQ files where we actually have the sequences that the sequencer produced. We put it some into some kind of a tool uh, called the taxonomic profiler or taxonomic classifier that uses a reference database. It compares the sequences that were produced uh, by the sequencer to the reference uh, uh, sequences in the reference database. And from there, you get a so-called taxonomic profile, where for each sample that you processed, uh, you actually have uh, a list of the microbes that the taxonomic profiler identified and that were present in both the sample and in, your, and in the reference database. That's for the rough summary of microbiome analysis for modern microbiome. How does it uh, change when we do ancient microbi microbiome analysis? Well, actually not so much. The only difference is that um, in ancient microbi microbiome analysis, all the bacteria, at least the bacteria that uh, are endogenous to the sample, the original bacteria of the sample are dead. So we don't really extract the DNA from the bacteria, rather we sequence the DNA that is available in the sample already from the dead bacteria. And, and actually not only the bacteria, all living, formerly living organism uh, present in the sample, all DNA, uh, we sequence it. That's also why um, this field is also um, uh, known as metagenomics because we sequence all the DNA that is available in the sample. And for the rest, it's pretty much the same. So it's once you have the DNA, you sequence it, you get this FASQ file, use a taxonomic profiler and a reference, reference database, and then you get your taxonomic profile. There is, however, one big difference uh, is that you have to suit up, suit up like a cosmonaut, uh, basically, when you work in an ancient DNA laboratory because you don't want to contaminate your sample. So these uh, this suits that 
might look uh, like you're working in a in a, a grade five or grade four laboratory uh, on the most deadly COVID virus is actually not to protect you from the sample, but rather to protect the sample from you because you don't want to introduce any of your personal DNA uh, into the samples that you're going to analyze later. Uh, but I think already uh, Zandra and Irina, and Irina told you about this yesterday. So how does it work a bit more in detail? So this is a figure that um, I extracted from the review paper that I uh, put in the reading list. Um, so you start with your metagenome, uh, or rather your sample that is sequenced. Uh, usually when we work with ancient DNA, uh, we don't use uh, paired and reads of 100 or 155 pair pairs, meaning sequences of up to 150 letters. We work with a bit shorter um, uh, sequences because we know that our, our sequence in our sample are going to be smaller. Then there is some uh, pre-processing that is uh, uh, done using tools to remove the adapters and the indices and et cetera, uh, like James mentioned in his, uh, in his talk on Eager. Then you, with a taxonomic profiler tool and some kind of database, uh, you compare it. You compare it, the research you got from your sample to this database, and then you get your taxonomic profile. And from there, the analysis that you uh, Whichever analysis you want to do, you usually do it from there. There are a lot of other ways to analyze metagenomic samples, but this is the main way uh, to work with ancient DNA samples. And we'll come to this back at the end. Yeah, so this is the way uh, that we analyze. I think there is a Matteo who wants to enter the room. Yeah. Um, however, uh, when you work with uh, databases that contain a lot of reference sequences, you have to be able to deal with uh, ambiguity in taxonomic assignation. What am I talking about? Let's take an example. So imagine you're uh, sequencing a sample, and then uh, out of your sample, uh, you get this sequence of the DNA. The original sequence of DNA, the one that uh, you would have liked to find is the full one, the, all of the letters, but the one that you were able to sequence that the machine actually was able to read because of uh, diverse reasons, you only get the letters in black. You don't get the letter that are in pink. Now you, you're happy, you still sequence something, it's short, but you still sequence something. And then you get a second, a second sequence. And uh, still the same, the, the letters that you were able to read are only the letter in black. But however, the original sequence, the, the true sequence that you were, weren't able to get entirely is the full sequence, uh, meaning the pig and the black. And if you pay attention uh, to the differences between these two sequences, the black letters are actually the same, but the pink ones are not the same meaning that they are probably coming from two different species, but you don't know that yet because you only have the black letters. So how do you deal with this ambiguity? How do you assign actually this sequence to uh, some kind of species or some kind of level, taxonomic level? Um, so you compare your uh, sequences to the reference database, and then it turns out that you have actually two genomes or two species of bacteria, uh, for example, in the reference database that share exactly this black uh, sequence. So you're like, hmm, which one is it? Is it the blue bacteria or is it the green bacteria? And to solve this ambiguity, uh, we'll introduce an algorithm uh, in the next slide. And the algorithm that we need to introduce, it is so-called lowest common ancestor algorithm. So species level assign assignation is not always possible, as we saw in the previous slide, because you might share exactly the same sequence between two different species or between the reads uh, that are mapping to two different species. So the LC algorithm is uh, represented by this, uh, by this tree. So imagine you have some kind of uh, 
uh, you know that there is some kind of relation between your species. And then you know that uh, here in the previous slide, you had uh, uh, your reads that were uh, corresponding to the blue and the green bacteria. So let's say the blue bacteria is this number four and the green bacteria is this number five. And instead of saying, well, I have something that will that is assigned to four and five. So I have four and five present in my sample, which is not so realistic because you don't know if it's either four or five or both. You say, well, I don't, I can't say if it's four or five, but I will bring it up back in the tree. So I will have one, uh, I will be less precise and I will go back in the tree and I will say it's from the common ancestor of four and five. So here too. You could say, imagine if the blue bacteria was number four and if the green bacteria was number seven, well, if we take the common ancestor of four and seven, then we'll go back up in the tree of one. So I'm talking about a tree here, but do we even have a tree that uh, organizes these bacteria together? Well, biology is complicated, but fortunately for us, we have this so-called tree of life that people have been working on for many, many, many years, and it's still changing every year, where we have actually have this tree for every known species of bacteria, and not only bacteria, actually, every uh, uh, organism that we sequence the genome of, we have the, this tree of life where we have this organization and how uh, organisms uh, relate one to another, and in our case, bacteria. And this tree of life uh, is actually organized in taxonomy, uh, um, where we have different uh, scale of the taxonomy. So from the most precise one to the more broad one. Uh, so for example, for, uh, for this, um, the red fox, the name of the species is Vulpes vulpes, but the name of the genus is Vulpes. It's from the family Canidae, in the order of the carnivora, in the class Mammalia, the phylum Chordata, etc. And each level of this tree corresponds to a level in the taxonomy. So by using both the lowest common ancestor algorithm and the organization in a tree with different taxonomic level, when we have hits that correspond to uh, sequences that are the same in the database, we can actually bring them back up or less precise, but still assign them to a given taxonomic rank so that we're not actually making a false positive assignation, uh, but rather we choose to be a bit less precise. So talking about these uh, different taxonomic profilers or taxonomic classifiers, there are a lot of them that employ different strategy. The strategy differ, differ uh, in the reference that they, they use, whether it's using a uh, whole genome, so the whole of the genome of the organisms available or the bacteria available, several parts of the genome or single parts of the genome. They differ also on how they look up this uh, reference databases whether they perform an alignment or whether they don't perform an alignment, whether they uh, look, they compare the DNA directly to the DNA present in databases or they compare the DNA to protein databases. It's actually a whole course in itself that I've given two years ago. And if you want to learn more about this um, taxonomic profilers algorithm and databases, I invite you to check out on my website maximbori.com slash courses. There is a whole lecture on taxonomic classifiers and sequence alignment algorithms. But that's not for today. So uh, here are the most common taxonomic profilers or taxonomic classifiers used in ancient DNA. The three most common one. So the first one is uh, Kraken 2. It's uh, very fast taxonomic profilers that doesn't perform alignments. And because it doesn't perform alignments, it has a lower specificity. So you will have, you would end up having usually more false positive assignation, meaning it will probably tell you that there are species uh, that are in your sample that actually don't, are not in your sample, uh, false positive assign assignations. But it is very, very fast and sometimes when you use a very big database or when you have a very, very big sample, it's sometimes the only option that you have to use. The second one is uh, Metaflan. 
it doesn't use whole genome databases. Rather, it uses a custom created marker databases. So it looks at specific portion of the reference genome. It's reasonably fast. And it's usually a good balance between specificity and sensitivity. So it finds it doesn't produce too much false positive, but it also doesn't produce too much false negative. And the last one that is uh, commonly used is MOLT. It's uh, a program that can use big whole genome databases. But when you use these big whole genome databases, it's very becomes quite slow and very resource hungry to the point that sometimes you can't even use it because it's just required too much resources to run. However, if your sample is small enough and if you have a computing server or cluster rather big enough, and when I mean big enough, I mean very, very big, we're talking about uh, terabytes of uh, memory here, it usually provides the best balance between specificity and sensitivity, but you have to be patient. Some samples could take days or weeks to run. And yeah, you need very, very big servers. So the one that we're gonna demonstrate today is Metaflam. And uh, if you actually want to learn more uh, about which taxonomic profiler or taxonomic classifier is the best, I invite you to check the Kami challenge. Uh, I put the link here on this slide where they compare, uh, among other things, taxonomic classifiers of different samples. So last but not least, uh, we need to talk about the reference database. So when you use, for example, MOLT or Kraken that can use these whole genome databases, uh, the two common databases that uh, are used are the data databases for the NCBI. The NCBI is the National Center for Biological Information. I'm not too sure of the acronym, but it's the uh, very big organization in the US that stores uh, pretty much every sequencing data ever published. And they have two databases, or there are many, many databases, but they have two that we're particularly interested in, the uh, non redundant database, which essentially houses uh, every sequence ever published, but is not curated, and the RefSeq databases, database, which is a, actually a created subset of the NR database. So it's when you want to choose between these two databases, it's a trade-off between sensibility, sensitivity and specificity. If you want to be more uh, sensitive, then you would go for this NRNT GenBank database. If you want more specificity, you would uh, go for the rest of the database. However, I have to warn you, these database grow every year, almost every day. And nowadays, uh, as I was saying in the previous slide, it's almost impossible to use a mold with this database. And it even become complicated to use Kraken with this database. You really need very, very, very big uh, computing infrastructures. And then there, there are custom databases of Metaflan that uses these uh, clade specific markers where they selected, they created manually uh, specific portions of the reference genomes uh, that are specific to uh, different taxonomic levels. All right. So, um, how is ancient DNA microbiome different from modern microbiome analysis? Uh, so, the main, for you, the main difference will be that usually we have to show that our sample is what we claim it to be. When we work with a modern sample, let's say you work in a clinical setting, you take a sample from uh, a patient, you know where the sample is coming from because you took it directly from the patient. But when you work with sample coming from the field, it's not all the time clear uh, where the sample is coming, from which uh, species it's coming from, from which time period it's coming from, etc. So you need to uh, use a lot of different methods from different fields to prove uh, what your sample, that your sample is what you're claiming it to be. So 
Regarding the time period, we use probably um, isotopic analysis uh, to date your sample. Regarding the source, uh, you have to check if it's on the correct host. So I think Fiorina and Zanera told you about Cupra ID yesterday, where you can compare, uh, check if it's coming more for human or dog host. Sometimes it's not all the time clear, and for this use both the microbiome profile, so which bacteria are there, and the host DNA. You have to check it's very, if it's from the correct ecological niche. So is it uh, more uh, poop sample or paleosis sample, or is it actually just dirt? You have to check for contamination. So how much of the sample is endogenous? How much is it actually from the original sample, and how much is modern contamination. So for this, you can check the taxonomic composition of the bacteria that carry this uh, uh, damage is specific to ancient DNA, this C2T damage. Is there a lot of modern contamination from the excavation, the lab, etc.? You have to check up the taxonomic composition of the bacteria that do not contain this damage, and so on and so forth. So we just talk. Uh, briefly about this uh, ancient DNA damage that affects taxonomic profiling. You also know uh, from the previous lectures that usually ancient DNA is usually in quite short sequences. So I have a little question for you that I will launch the poll right now. Which do you think is more problematic for ancient DNA microbiome analysis? The ancient DNA deamination damage, the C2T uh, deamination, the short fragment lengths or both? I will wait like a few minutes for everyone to answer. Then we'll go through the results. Right, let's wait. One minute more. All right. So it seems that we have uh, most or more than half of the people that think that both are problematic and for the two other options, it's equally uh, distributed. So uh, yeah, here are the results. So actually, uh, it's a question that, uh, that scientists in the field were asking themselves. And it turns out that damage is actually not really an issue. So this is a, a figure from an article from um, Irina and colleagues. Uh, that was published um, two or three years ago, 2018. Yes. And here on this figure, they compare the uh, simulated uh, microbiome communities with and without damage. And they use different taxonomic classifiers. Uh, so here you have metaflan, you have mold, uh, you have some other one that I didn't introduce. And, uh, and you can see, uh, both for the, the, there is the symbol, both for the uh, community simulated with ancient DNA damage and the community simulated without ancient DNA damage as a modern uh, data. And you can see on this point where they compare them that actually the points almost always overlap or are very close one to another. So meaning the result, the taxonomic profile at the end barely changes whether there is damage or not. So this is kind of a good news because it means even when you have a lot of damage, actually, it doesn't so much influence the taxonomic profiling, the results at the end that tells you which bacteria are in your sample or not. Um, however, uh, short sequences, and especially very short sequences, are more problematic. Uh, if we go back to the, the slide where we had this ambiguity in taxonomic assignation, you could see that, uh, for example, in the two sequences that we sequenced, if we have, would it be only one letter more, if we would have uh, wrist or DNA fragments in our sample that would have been one letter longer, 
we wouldn't have had this ambiguity and we would have been able to assign each sequence to the species that it's coming from. And in general, the shorter the sequences you are, the less uh, precision you will have in the taxonomic assignation. And uh, when you actually, when people actually um, used DNA uh, sequences that they compare to protein databases, because there are also protein databases that didn't talk about, you actually need to convert your DNA into a protein sequence. And if some of you are familiar with uh, the so-called code of life or from your biology lecture, you will remember that three DNA bases called for one amino acid, which means that if you have a sequence that is, uh, that is made up of 30 layers of DNA, in protein, you will have only 10 amino acids. And then you go back to the same problem, the shorter the sequences you are, the less precision you have. So this is why protein alignment usually in, is not a very good idea in uh, ancient DNA research because you end up with sequences that are way too short. There is also something else that I didn't introduce, uh, which is called uh, 16S uh, ribosomal RNA amplification that is used a lot in modern microbiome, but that's not really applicable very successfully in ancient DNA because you need to target sequences that are usually too long for the fragments that we have in ancient DNA, the fragment lengths that you have in ancient DNA. And if you want to learn about this, about this topic, I invite you to check the article of Irina and colleagues and uh, this review that was published very recently on ancient DNA analysis. Yes. So uh, if we go back to the review paper that I put in the readings and compare uh, ancient DNA versus uh, modern microbiome analysis, so this is the, what you can do with modern microbiomes. In ancient DNA, it's a bit more limited because we don't have the same data. So first of all, uh, our microbes are dead. So there is no, we can't culture them. We can't grow them in a Petri dish. That's not possible, they're dead. So all of this uh, cultural analysis, uh, don't think about it. Uh, as I was saying just before, this 16S RNA, we can't really do it because the DNA sequences that we get are too short, so we can't really work with that. Uh, the, our mRNA analysis using this metatranscriptome, um, some people have tried, but uh, usually RNA degrades very fast, and it's not super successful. Some people are trying, but so far it hasn't been a huge success in the field. So what we're left with, we're left with actually the metagenome analysis and to some extent, the virome analysis. The viruses are a bit more complicated than bacteria because, well, first of all, we don't have so many viruses in reference databases and some viruses are made of RNA, which degrades very fast as well, or much faster than DNA. So vir virome is actually uh, yet uh, another field that's uh, is to explore for ancient DNA or to, to be improved upon. So what will we get today in our tutorial? So we'll first, uh, and we'll first get our taxonomic table that we generate with Metaflam. Uh, we'll look at the alpha diversity uh, between our different group of samples, the beta diversity, and the group taxonomy. I will briefly, briefly talk about the classification of our samples, and the rest is up to you to explore if you ever work on an ancient microbiome project. Uh, so before we switch to the, the tutorial, we have uh, a few time, a few minutes for question. So what I want you all to do is to click on, or rather you can't click, but go on this link, uh, tinyurl.com slash microbiome tutorial, I click on it myself and you will end up on a page like this, uh, something called binder, and it will basically start a small server for you. Yeah, it's pretty quick right now, uh, but it might not be as quick for all of you. So while it starts for everyone, we have time for a few questions. Um, 
if there is anyone that has a question in mind, uh, feel free to go ahead. And then we start the tutorial part in four minutes. Otherwise, you have four minutes of breaks. So the link to the binder is um, tiny uh, tinyurl.com slash ancient. Yes, thank you very much. Put it again. So we have a question from William um, Sots as to why damage has a reduced impact. Yes. Um, so why damage has a, has a reduced impact? So damage is not a binary. Um, so it's not whether all of the sequences have damage or not. So when you look at this uh, damage plot, uh, you can see the proportion of damage that, uh, first of all, decreases the further you go into the sequence. And even on the first phase, uh, usually even in a very degraded sample, you would have 20% of the first bases or the first cytosines that are uh, transformed into uh, thymines. 40% if it's very, very degraded, but it means that you still have the majority of your bases that uh, remain thymine. So you still can assign them quite well. And because we use alignment methods, or because some of the this method that I've highlighted use alignment methods, it can account for uh, some variability in the sequences and still get a correct taxonomic assignment. I hope this answered the question. Can damage have any effect on the paired and the paired alignment? Uh, so I'm not too sure I understand your question, Anna. Uh, so whether you work with single end data or paired end data, you will uh, anyway have damaged. Uh, you will anyway have damage. It doesn't influence it so so much. With paired end data, you will actually uh, get. Uh, slightly better uh, sequencing quality because you sequence for both ends. So the three prime end in the middle is actually uh, sequenced better because it's overlapping from the two ends, but it doesn't influence so much the damage. How can you classify an ancient microbiome? Do you compare uh, their sequences with modern ones? Uh, question from Konstantinos. Uh, so this is actually what we're going to do right now. So uh, that's what I was also introducing in the slides before. So when you work with the ancient microbiome, you get your DNA, you sequence it, and then you compare this DNA to modern, to reference databases of uh, reference genomes that contain the sequences of the, the genomes. Most of the genomes or all of the genomes are actually from modern references, and then you look at which pieces correspond. Sorry, can I ask you something? Like to do it more uh, like specific request. Can you hear me, first of all? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, like, uh, for example, we we find an ancient microbiome and we do all these uh, things in order to get the sequences. But uh, even if we compare it with modern ones, maybe, I don't know if we, for sure, we we see some uh, like uh, similarity with modern ones, or even we see it. We can classify them in in uh, with them with the moderns, like uh, to see uh, to to say that this uh, belongs to that uh, space of bacterium or something like this. I don't know. This is my intuition. What do you think about? Yeah, it? it's actually a good intuition. So it's a problem that not only happens with ancient. Uh, ancient samples, but also with modern samples, uh, the reference databases are not exhaustive, even though they're already very, very big and growing every day, they're not exhaustive. So it's not for sure that uh, you're gonna, the 
DNA that you sequence is already represented in modern in reference databases, especially if you're working with ancient samples. So usually, depending on the sample that you work with, you can assign between 40% and 50%, it's ballpark numbers, uh, of the sequences. The rest is unclassified. You don't really know what this is. So this is why there are also other techniques that I'm not going to talk about today, which you can find in this, uh, in this review that I posted, that, and also in the reading uh, that I put in the, in the GitHub. Uh, you can use these de novo assembly methods uh, to look at these uh, sequences that are not present in reference databases. OK, thanks. All right. So um, I think, yes. All right, I think everyone has been able to uh, load the binder. So welcome. To Binder. Um, Binder is actually a small uh, Jupyter server. So for those of you who've never used of, uh, who have never heard of Jupyter, it's a program that allows you to run uh, interactive notebooks, computational notebooks, um, on in your browser. And here uh, you have a server that is provided by different cloud companies. Some of you might be on Google Cloud. Some of you might be on OVH, they provide this server for free. It's a small server, but it's for free. Um, so on the left here, you have your kind of file explorer. And on the right part, uh, you don't need to worry about that for the moment. So if you click uh, on notebooks uh, and then uh, download and subsample.ypynb, it will open uh, this notebook and it will tell you uh, select kernel. And then you choose uh, the default, what is already pre-selected, Python conda amp notebook. All right. Uh, and this is the first notebook that I prepared. We're not gonna run this one. It's just to um, introduce you to the sample that we're gonna work with today. It's the sample, uh, it's a sample that is coming from a previously uh, published research. Uh, let me show you what the sample uh, looks like. Uh, so it's actually the sample from the copyright paper and it's the ZAP P28 sample. So I think the one from the right. So it's a, a paleophysis samples that comes from a, a cave in uh, Mexico, uh, in the region of Durango. Um, yeah, so this is the sample that we're gonna work with uh, today. It's a sample that is, uh, let me fetch it, the P28, that is approximately uh, 3,300 years old. All right, let's go back to our notebook. So this is uh, what I prepared. And because we have a very small computing server, I actually subsampled uh, the, the, the sample so that out of all the reads that we had originally, all the DNA sequences that uh, the sequencer produced, uh, I only kept 1 million of them so that it can fit on the small server that we're working with today. So you can actually close the notebook. If you go on the tab here, and click, uh, if you, over here, we will have a small cross that appears and you can close it. If it will, yeah. And the main notebook that we're gonna use it, be using is the notebook called analysis.ypynb. So let's open it. And then again, click Conda on notebook. All right. So welcome to the analysis notebook that we're gonna have today. So first of all, uh, if you've never used Jupyter, uh, Jupyter has this concept of cells um, and you can execute the cell, meaning run the code that is present in every cell. If you're uh, not very comfortable with it, um, all the code is already actually I was already run, so you can 
just scroll through um, all the, the, the code and all the results are already there. So if you just want to look at the results, you can already have a look at it. However, we'll go through what we're doing uh, step by step. And for this, I actually will dare to do something. I will right click and uh, delete all the results that are already produced. So I'm throwing myself into a whole lot of trouble if it crashes right now, because then I don't have any results anymore. So uh, how does this, this, this Jupyter notebook actually work? So if you double click on something, you will see that you can actually edit it. So this so-called markdown cell. So it's just some text with a special syntax. So we can uh, render it. And to uh, run a cell or to execute it, you have this little play button here on the top. So if you click play, then it's rendered. So to edit a cell, you double click on it. And to render it or to execute it, you click on the play button. And you can click on pretty much everything. Everything is a cell. If, when it's rendered, it doesn't look like a cell anymore. But if you click on it, it goes back, look, looks back as, as a cell. And then you can execute it. So this is just text. There is no code. Um, as I said, this was a markdown cell with the special markdown syntax. Now we can actually run some code. And that's the whole purpose of this, is to be able to run some code. So this is actually written in the Python language. Uh, we are just doing a print. So if you click on it and then click on the play button, it's actually going to run it. And then we'll get the output. So here we're just printing. This is a Python cell. We can also um, execute bash commands. So bash is the language that uh, most of you have by default when you open a terminal, whether you have a Mac, uh, a Linux, or a Ubuntu-based computer, or uh, even I think it's the default in Windows when you open a console. And same, you just press play. You just have to put this little exclamation bar before to specify that it's bash. Uh, it's in bash language. And if you want to have multi-line uh, bash cells, you have to put this uh, so-called uh, Jupyter magic command, which is this uh, percentage percentage bash. Then you can have uh, multi-line bash commands. Again, press play. Uh, so now that we uh, got ourselves uh, more familiar with um, the, the Jupyter uh, interface, let's go through what actually I've prepared for you and what we're going to do. So first of all, I was doing some data processing after uh, keeping only 1 million reads. I actually removed all the reads that were corresponding to the human genome, because uh, we've shown that it's a sample that comes from a, a human poop. And to do this, I've used um, eager, actually. And uh, I only kept the reads that didn't correspond to the, um, to the human uh, genome. So this is the command that uh, I ran. You can find it. Also, there is a folder. If you can look after the tutorial, you can look there is a folder called scripts where you have the full eager command that I used. Once I got these reads that were clean of where I removed all the, the, the human sequences, I then use adapter removal, uh, which is a tool that also uh, James has already introduced the other day, where I remove um, all the adapters, I remove the low quality sequences. And then uh, I, uh, if the forward and reverse reads, because these are paired and sequencing, if the forward and reverse reads are overlapping by at least uh, 11 base pairs, I merge them together. And I take all the output files of adapter removal. I combine them together because Metaflam doesn't really use the paired and information. And then I combine them in one single FASTQ file that I will later feed to Metaflan. So how does Metaflan works? So we can actually uh, run it. So if we click on the cell, we click play, and then we get the help message of Metaflan, which is actually uh, very long. So you can scroll through it. You see there are a lot of options and a lot of different ways of using it. 
uh, we're using the version three of Metaflan that was uh, released earlier this year. Metaflan is actually a tool uh, published uh, by a lab in Italy. And uh, yeah, so we can you can look at um, the whole help message. Uh, tells you how to give it an input, uh, what input, what options, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. However, the command that I use to run, that I already ran for you because uh, Metaflan doesn't need a big server, but this one is uh, really too small to, um, to run Metaflan. Uh, the command that I use and to pre-compute uh, this taxonomic profile is uh, the one right here. So I gave it uh, our pre-process file with, um, with adapter removal. I told you that I told it that it's a fastq file. I told it where to find the Metaflan database, and I gave I told him I told Metaflan to write uh, the output in this file, and the results are actually located here. Um, it's actually we can have a look at it. Um, it's a tab, so you, to have a look at it, you click on this link, and then you will end up on this. It's a tab separated file where you have some metadata at the top, the lines that start with a hash or a pound sign. And then you have the different taxonomic levels with the relative abundance, meaning how much of the uh, reads in the sample they correspond to. Uh, we can also look at only the top of this file uh, by using the bash command head. So if I execute it, we have the first, uh, I believe, 10 lines of the file uh, here. So you can look at it manually. Um, however, it's a bit tedious to look at this. It's not super human friendly, even though it's already quite readable. So to explore it a bit further, uh, we'll use a tool called Pavian. So Pavian is, a, is an interactive app uh, to explore the results of different taxonomic classifiers. So it works with Metaflan, but it also works with Kraken and a few other uh, taxonomic profilers or classifier. So are there different ways to run it? You can run it through Docker, you can run it through R, and otherwise you can run the uh, online version. So you just have to click on this link and then it will um, um, redirect, redirect you to the online version of it. So as we're, uh, I don't know how many of people are in this, uh, in this call and this tutorial, but uh, 50 actually. So if the 50 of us click on it, I'm not sure it will work for the 50 person because those are free resources and usually there is a limit of the amount of users that can run it in parallel. So give it a try, but it might not work or it might be really slow. I have the offline version in Docker uh, prepared here, but it's exactly the same uh, interface. So once you are in Pavian, uh, let me zoom out. So you will go to data selection. Uh, let's refresh the page. So I have a fresh run. Uh, and then you click on browse and you select uh, the uh, file um, and the, the output file of Metaflan. So you would have to uh, download the file that we just pro, uh, processed um, with uh, Metaflan because it's right now it's on the, the Jupyter notebook server. Uh, if you downloaded it, uh, you can uh, use it in Pavian, otherwise you can just look at my screen and do it a bit after. I think it would be easier also for the free server that runs Pavian. So I open it, um, and I loaded it, uh, loaded it successfully. Then we can have a look at the results. So um, here it's a bit confusing because uh, a lot of tools actually work with raw reads number, but Metaflan doesn't work, or by default, the rest of Metaflan are not raw read numbers, so not the number of reads, but rather relative abundances. So here, this one is not so informative because according to this, all the reads were classified. It's not true. We don't also don't have 100 reads. We have 1 million of them. 
but work with relative abundance and the sum of all relative abundance is one represent. So what is more informative is to look at this kind of plot, the so-called Sankey plots, where we can see which bacteria were identified and how they relate to each other. So we can see that all of the sequences that were identified correspond to bacteria, uh, and they are in, uh, in different clades, in different groups. We have uh, bacteria from the Prevotelaceae family, Clospetaceae, Eubacteriaceae. I'm not going to dare to pronounce this one, Ruminococaceae, and uh, Spiro. Yeah, this one is also hard to pronounce. <laughs> Um, so you can see which bacteria were identified. And what is quite nice, actually, for this sample, is that we have this bacteria identified, also the so-called uh, Triponema succinifacians. And this bacteria is actually known to not be present in uh, modern individuals that live a Western diet, meaning individuals that, like me and you, most likely, that go to the supermarket to get their food, that have access to modern medicine on a regular basis, antibiotics, etc. This bacteria is only found in non-Westernized populations, so people who still live a very traditional uh, way of life, mostly away from uh, modern society, so isolated tribes in Amazonia, for example, uh, where they don't have access to supermarkets, not a regular access to modern medicine, etc. And it's quite nice to see that because we're working with an ancient sample. We have to remember that our sample is more than 3,000 years old. So it's uh, nice to see that uh, when they didn't have access to this modern medicine and this modern way of life, uh, they still had this bacteria like people who still don't have access uh, regularly to, to this uh, way of life. Uh, then you can look also in a table way can also click on the comparison uh, and look at the different species that you have, etc. You can go back to it after and browse it on your own. Uh, but for now, let's go back to the Jupyter tutorial. We can also use another tool called Krona uh, to visualize this. It makes uh, this nice plot. So it's already finished, actually, I, I believe. So the plots, uh, you can uh, get it here. So you go. You, sorry, so we were in notebook. You click back on the little folder icon, go back one level, click on results, click on Krona, and then click on uh, ZSM 028 Krona dot HTML that we just generated. And you just have to click on trust HTML. And then you have this uh, so called Krona plot that is also interactive. Um, when you can, where you can explore uh, the different bacteria that were found. For example, you can see that 7% of what we found were uh, from the genus Prevotella. Uh, here uh, we have our, let's search for our Triponema. Our Triponema is here. And then we have our Triponema succinic patients. So there is another nice way to visualize the results from MetaPlan. All right, um, so those, those were the ancient sample by itself, but what is very interesting is actually to compare it to other sample, and here we're going com to compare it to modern reference data. So to get our reference, modern reference data, uh, what I'm using is a project called uh, Curated Metagenomics, uh, which is a published R package. So when you work usually in bioinformatics, you have to be a bit polyglot, uh, know different languages, Bash, Python, R, and be able to do some, at least some of it, because some tools are written in a specific language, some in another, and you want to be able to use um, all of them. So here, this, uh, this tool, Created Metagenomics, is very nice because it has created metadata and uh, samples pre-processed with Metaplan, so we can select uh, Sample here, I select uh, sample that are coming from stool, so from, from poop, uh, that do not use antibiotics and uh, that are healthy. And I want 100 random sample from the non-Westernized uh, groups and 100 sample from the Westernized groups. Uh, 
And then I want their metaphylline pre-processed um, taxonomic profiles, and I get them here. Um, and they are split by different taxonomic ranks. So this is what I presented earlier. And we're going to work today at the species level and also at the phylum uh, level. So all the files are available in this. Uh, you can click in this uh, different uh, directories. And here we have the metadata. Um, so if you're familiar with Python and Pandas, uh, this shouldn't be uh, too crazy for you. If you're not, don't worry. It's just some data uh, data processing uh, to transform the data so that we can merge them together. You would probably do it in a in a program such as Excel or Open Office. It wouldn't be recommended, but you could try. You can also do it in R or in whatever language you're familiar with. So here, what I'm doing is uh, loading the metaflan results from our ancient sample. Um, I'm renaming some columns, extracting only the species rank, and then uh, doing the same, extracting the phylum rank. I'm loading the species and uh, the phylum and the species level for the modern sources. And then I'm putting in putting them together with a function called merge from pandas. Uh, let's execute this actually. So there is also, uh, if you're too lazy like me to click on the play button every time, there is also a keyboard shortcut, which is a control enter to run the cell. So you select the cells, control enter. And you can see that uh, before the cell I executed on the left, uh, there is nothing with these brackets. While it's executing, there will be a little star. And once it's executed, there is this little number. So I'm executing them one by one. This is live. So I'm looking at the top of uh, the results for our ancient data sample, loading Python function, uh, creating this list, getting the species for the ancient sample, getting the phylum for the ancient sample getting the phylum for the modern sample in all the 200 samples that we have in the modern sample, in the modern data set, getting the species, looking at what species we have, and then merging them. Finally, I load the metadata, and here's what the metadata looks like. We have a lot of metadata about the modern sample. So, so once we have this loaded, we can start to do some interesting things. The first thing that we could do as plots is to compare the taxonomic composition between our modern and ancient sample. So uh, we prepare, uh, again, we do some data wrangling uh, to prepare a group information so that we know which sample are belonging to which group, if it's coming from a westernized individual or a non-westernized individual, or if it's our ancient sample. And then we load the library that we're going to use uh, for doing these plots, which is called plot9. It's a Python clone of ggplot, if some of you are using it in R. Again, some data wrangling. And finally, the plot. And here we have a so-called stack bar plot, where uh, we can see the different bacterial phylum uh, present in the different groups. So in our ancient sample, where there is only one in our ancient group, where there is only one our ancient sample, the mean and then the mean uh, abundance of the different phylum in our non-westernized and westernized uh, group. So here uh, we can see that we have actually a phylum that is completely missing in our ancient sample, which is the actinobacteria uh, sample. And you might wonder why, and we actually come back to this a bit later, but these plots are usually quite nice to compare the overall global composition uh, between the sample that you're studying and the reference sample here, modern non-westernized and westernized sample. So once we uh, looked at uh, this taxonomic composition at the phylum level, Let's remember that the phylum level is uh, here in the taxonomy compared to the species here. 
uh, we'll look at the ecologic diversity. So in ecology, there is this uh, concept of diversity and there are uh, different uh, level or granulation of diversity. The first one that we're um, going to talk about is the so-called alpha diversity, which is a measure of the diversity within each sample independently. So there are different ways to measure this diversity. There are different metrics, different indices to measure this diversity, but it's essentially answering this diversity measure, alpha diversity measure, is essentially answering the question how diverse is one sample? Is it a sample that is composed of very little, um, very little microbes, or rather is there a lot of micro diverse microbes in my sample? And because we compute it per sample, we can compare it uh, if you have uh, alpha diversity of one uh, and in one sample and an alpha diversity of five in another sample, you can say that the one that has an alpha diversity of five is much more diverse than the sample that has an alpha diversity of one. So here we're gonna look at um, three different indices of alpha diversity, and we're gonna compute them with a, a, a Python library called Scikit-Bio. Uh, and we're gonna look at the uh, species richness, the Shannon and Simpson index of diversity. If you want to learn more about uh, how they are computed, uh, what's the mathematical formula behind this, I uh, put links to each of these um, indices of diversity. So we compute them uh, individually with Scikit-Bio. So for Shannon, Simpson, and the richness. And then we put them all together in a table that we call alpha diversity. So for all our sample, we have the Shannon, Simpson, and richness. And now we add the metadata to prepare the plot. We transform it a bit to have it in a so-called tidy format. And this is what it looks like. So we have in the first column, the uh, name of our sample. In the second column, we have the group information, whether it's our ancient sample, westernized and non-westernized. Which uh, in this and in this tidy format, you have this column called index, which in this index of diversity we're looking at, and then the actual number of this diversity. And this is the plot that we get. Taking a few seconds to run. So we have the richness on the left panel, the Shannon in the middle, and the Simpson on the right. So uh, first of all, you have to pay attention, it's not the same scale. So the species richness is just counting the number of different species that are in your sample. And the Shannon and Simpson are actually more complicated uh, formula. So you can't compare uh, between different indices, but you can compare within the same index of diversity, you can compare the different groups. And here we have actually uh, two plots that are overlaid on top uh, of one another. We have uh, just the value for each sample, so each of these dots. And then we have a so-called violin plot, which is um, somehow representing the distribution of our sample. And we can see that um, systematically, the, the alpha diversity, meaning how diverse the sample is, is roughly the same uh, between Western and uh, uh, sorry, between westernized and non-westernized individuals. We didn't perform a statistical test, so there might be a difference if you perform a statistical test, but just by looking at it roughly, we can see it's roughly the same. Uh, however, our sample is uh, here in red is much, much lower. So again, uh, we could see that we were missing a phylum in, uh, in the stack bar plot before. And here we can see that we have much less species than in the reference modern sample. So we might be wondering what's happening with this sample. And it's actually the question, the second poll that I'm gonna launch right now. Uh, polls, let's, uh, what do you think is happening uh, right now? Why do we observe this uh, difference between the ancient our ancient sample and the modern reference uh, samples. 
All right, let's do it for one minute. In the meantime, you can have a small breather, have a drink, or ask a question if you want. All right, let's end the poll, share the results. So actually, um, most of you were actually right, actually uh, more than two thirds of you were right. Um, here, the main reason why you observe this big difference is that uh, to prepare this tutorial and to be able to run um, uh, this sample on our very small server, I had to downsample to subsample the original sample and keep only 1 million reads. Uh, so if we look actually at the original paper uh, here, uh, we can see uh, we can see that uh, our sample actually uh, looks um, looks very much, we are going to look at these plots just a bit later, but our sample looks very much like a, like an ancient uh, microbiome. So there are a lot of things in this ancient sample. It's just that for the sake of this tutorial, I had only to select uh, a few um, a few reads to keep so that it would fit on the server. And that's why we have so few um, species that we can observe uh, at the end. So actually, 70% yeah, were right. All right, let's continue. So now that we look at the alpha diversity, uh, we're going to look at another kind of, of diversity, which is uh, the so-called beta diversity. So the beta diversity is uh, a way to measure the diversity between the pair of samples, so to compare a sample uh, between each other. So in a way, it's a bit like computing a distance uh, between sample. So in the real life, um, if uh, you're on a plane or like on a piece of paper, and then you want to compute the distance between point A and point B, you would use the so-called Euclidean distance. Uh, if I want to compute the distance between my uh, right finger and my left finger, I will use the Euclidean distance. However, uh, here, it's not uh, samples on a piece of paper, it's uh, samples that reside in this, uh, uh, in another kind of dimensional space, this, the dimensional space of uh, which microbes are there. And to uh, compute this, dis this distance between samples, this beta diversity between sample, we don't use a Euclidean distance, uh, rather we use uh, a distance called the bray curtis dissimilarity. And uh, with this bray curtis dissimilarity, we actually end up getting a distance matrix, which tell us how far apart are, uh, is one sample from another. So to compute it, we uh, again use scikit-bio, uh, we use this common, uh, with break curtis and then we get this distance matrix, which is a square matrix uh, where you have uh, the sample in rows and the sample in columns, and an intersection, uh, you have uh, the distance between two samples. So a distance matrix is interesting, but uh, what is even better is to be able to look at it um, using what is called the PCOA. Uh, so or a principal coordinate analysis. So I guess many of you are familiar with PCA, principal component analysis, and it's a very principal coordinate analysis, a very similar concept, except that uh, in PCA, usually multi you multiply with uh, the covariance matrix uh, when you do the linear algebra behind. And here, you don't multiply uh, with your covariance matrix, 
Rather, you use this pre-computed distance matrix that we here we use the breaker this dissimilarity. So this is what it looks like. We have our principal components and our samples. And uh, yes, so we're going to look at um, the script plot to look how much of the variance is explained by our first principal components. So we can see that here, most of the variance is explained by our three first principal components. There is a big drop after that. So we're going to plot um, the first to the first three uh, principal components. So again, a bit of data wrangling uh, to reorganize the table. Then we plot the first two components, one against the other. Uh, and then we have this plot. So we can see that in uh, violet here, we have the westernized sample. In green, we have the non-westernized sample. We can see that they're somehow relatively well separated. And then we have our, sorry, ancient samples that falls close uh, to a non-westernized sample. Uh, because we said we look at the first three principal components, we also look at uh, one versus three. And then you can see that here, now it falls closer to a westernized sample. So uh, it's a bit hard to say. So in this situation, what you can do uh, is actually use a 3D plot. So 3D plots are a bit tricky sometimes to look at when they're printed, but because we're um, an uh, interactive server, <laughs> yes, it works. Because we're an interactive server, we can actually make an interactive plot and we can rotate it, uh, zoom in it, and we can actually get the name of the samples that are the closest to our ancient sample. So we can zoom, rotate, and we can see that actually the closest sample to the closest modern samples to our ancient sample are uh, both westernized and non-westernized. We can even see their name if we over uh, on, on them. So again, do you think this embeddings currently represents how our sample relates to modern reference samples? Given that we only have five species that were identified by Metaflan in our ancient samples and that we're doing this beta diversity or this distance uh, computation based on the only five species that we found, it's probably not a very good representation. And uh, that's what you can see when you go back to the original paper where this data is coming from. Here we have the same, we have the human versus the dog. And we can see that uh, all of the copolite that we sequence in this paper, including our sample, uh, fall very much um, within the human uh, diversity. So um, last but not least, another plot that we can perform is uh, a heat map with a clustering uh, by distance. And for this, we will use the Seaborn library. And here we have the distance that are directly visualized. And then we have this clustering, this hierarchical relationship uh, of our samples based on how related they are. And here it's a bit unfortunate because the, the, the legends didn't actually uh, display our uh, Zappe 28 or ZSM 28 sample because there are just too many names to display. Uh, you can definitely fix that. And if you want to do that, you can actually do it in the code. I'm not gonna do it right now, uh, but you can actually see it here. Our sample is here because these uh, labels are, are the same color that we use since the beginning. So red is our ancient sample. Uh, violet is our westernized modern sample. and Green is our non-westernized modern samples. You can see that our ancient sample here is in red. And if you zoom, oh, that was too much. If we zoom a bit more, um, we can see that there is a big white or being a thin white line uh, for our modern sample for most of the plots, meaning that it's pretty far from any other sample here. 
you have the distance. If it's zero, you're very close. If it's very red, you're very close. If it's very white, you're very far. And the only samples that it is related to or not too far of are the sample in this cluster. And if we, you look at the names, actually, um, if you look at the names of the sample in this cluster, it's actually the same sample that you can find in this plot that are around our ancient sample. So you can see that our uh, embedding, even though biologically it doesn't make a lot of sense because we only worked on the five species that were found in our ancient sample, uh, mathematically it makes sense it works because the samples that are the closest one on this heat map are actually the one that are the closest one in this lower dimensional space uh, using the PCOA. Um, last but not least, um, you could perform uh, additional steps. And one step that is often performed is um, uh, to use a program called Source Tracker, which can tell you uh, what your ancient sample is made of. So it's used. It uses um, a statistical framework called Gibbs sampling, which is a form of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, which can uh, tell you that your ancient sample is uh, most likely made of 30% of uh, modern contamination, 70%, uh, I don't know, 10% of soil, and the rest is unknown. Uh, however, the problem with this technique is that it takes a lot of time. Actually, when I was preparing this tutorial, I started to run it and after uh, 12 hours still didn't finish. So if you want to launch it on your own, it's probably not going to run on this server. But if you want to launch it on uh, a computer that you might have at this position, you can try. But it sometimes takes a lot of time. It, because of this um, Markov chain Monte Carlo, it's not guaranteed that uh, you're going to have an answer really quickly. Uh, but this is also a classical um, technique that is used in ancient microbiome analysis uh, to confirm that the sample that you're looking at is not completely um, soil or completely modern contamination. And I put you all the comments to, to run to prepare the file for the tracker. And this is actually the command that you can use uh, for a source tracker. And there are a lot of other steps that you could perform. Uh, so here we didn't talk about, uh, or we didn't use the damage. Uh, for performing damage, you would need to uh, perform some kind of alignments. So if you used molds, mold performs this alignment, but you can't always use molds because you don't have access to a gigantic server. So then you would have to perform the alignment per genome. And then you could use something called map damage or damage profiler to look at this damage and see if you actually, actually have damage. Or you can also use uh, pi damage if you have uh, several genomes in your sample or if you perform geno assembly and then uh, align your reads back to the sequences that you assemble with geno assembly. Uh, talking about assembly, you can perform assembly with uh, the two main programs that are used are called Megate and Metastates. And then when you want to perform assembly, which is essentially stitching the little short sequences that you have in uh, longer sequences by uh, looking at how these uh, small sequences overlap, you can actually uh, put together the uh, longer sequences that you assemble into even longer sequences or groups of sequences called bins, and the process called binning. And from this, you can uh, reconstruct uh, genomes potentially that are not present in reference uh, databases. And the main program to do binning are called Metabat2, MathBin2, and das tool. And to validate your bin, to look at how good your bins are, the main program to do so is called CheckM and Gunk. Another thing that you can do is uh, functional analysis. So look at uh, not the taxonomy, so not what species we uh, have in our sample, but look at actually what functions uh, are present in our sample. So you know that uh, in the genomes, there are uh, parts of the genome that are called genes. And genes are essentially recipe to make proteins, 
and proteins are kind of the factory of the cell. They're, um, they're machines that transform uh, uh, elements into others to make the cell actually work, whether it's in bacteria or even in our own cells. And it's very interesting to look at this functional analysis because you can see, for example, in our sample, let's say that you're looking at a wine sample, a potential wine sample, then you would, you would, would want to look for um, signs of genes that perform fermentation. Uh, and you can do this with programs uh, such as PROCA or human. You can do something called differential abundance, where you compare uh, between two different groups, uh, whether you have more of a bacteria in one group than the other, or more of a gene in one group than the other. And the statistical framework to do that, the most common one are called Maslin2, Lefsey, and Songbird. And then uh, if you're uh, more interested in a single genome of a bacteria of interest that you found, for example, in our sample, we, fold, we found Tryponema succinic patients. Maybe we're very interested in this bacteria and in, to investigate it further. We can do genotyping. So uh, comparing uh, the bacteria that we found to the reference genome of this bacteria and looking at which variation we identified and then perform phylogenies and et cetera, and et cetera. So this, is, uh, this was a bit to give you an overview of uh, the method that you can use on top of what we've done. And otherwise, I think that's uh, the end of this tutorial. Um, if you have enough, if you have, uh, I hope I didn't lose too many of you. So the code is on the GitHub. You can um, definitely go through it again a bit slower at your own pace. Uh, I put links a bit everywhere to different tools. Uh, to the documentations of the library that I mentioned. So you can go through it if you want, uh, step by step, and run it at your own pace. And if you have questions, now is the moment, I believe. Yeah, so if you have any questions for Maxime, please type them in the chat or maybe raise your hand. Now, I don't see any questions in the chat right now. So we'll just give it a minute. 